Thank you, Prof Wang. I think that was a very broad ranging uh, talk about um, everything from um, the way, I mean, has something for everyone here. For me, I mean, uh, really interesting to know about the way that Chinese have used strategic sort of uh, lineage practices and surnames. Uh, but there's also, uh, the talk also tells us about the way that uh, China has uh, managed to build on different kinds of governmental centered heritage in order to um, um, go forward. And for Singapore, of course, uh, this whole issue to do with the need to respect the complexity of diverse paths and how that can be made to work for us. So there are many issues, I think, that needs further discussion. I already see hands uh, sort of up even before I can finish, but I think I see Vivian's hand first and then uh, perhaps um, over to this side. So Vivian. Good morning, Professor Wang. Uh, I want to ask about um, cultural values that are not distinct to a particular culture, but may be part of a larger human experience that, that may be more universal. So you mentioned that hope for just governance is part of Chinese heritage, if I understand you correctly, and, and perhaps we can trace it as a historical narrative, but it is a universal hope. I mean, you find it in many societies. So how would you um, approach something like that where you can find maybe distinctive historical roots and you know we have Qi Yuan and so on and, and you can find examples in Chinese history but it is also a universal human hope. I, I like your response well, to that. I, I, I totally agree and of course every group of people have their own ideas of what represents good governance and what priorities they give to de determine and to what criteria they use to determine what is good governance. Uh, my example of China is simply to to use the fact that they draw upon their own traditions of the Confucian ideals of what is good governance, which is, which is really drawn from the sense of continuity with the ancient past, with the ancestral roots, as it were, of good governance as determined by their ancient uh, origins, original rulers of China, completely um, um, idealized. They're not, there's no historical record of those ancient uh, wise rulers and just rulers but so idealized and so absolutely captured by the whole Confucian tradition that it became implanted in the whole of their literature, or in fact all the classics and the history and in fact other branches of, uh, of knowledge as well. And that encapsulated the simple ideas that every Chinese peasant or, or, or so on would carry in their minds as good governance. Essentially governance by a wise, caring ruler there's no question of participation in that government, no question of being active in, uh, in political life or anything like that at all, or even to serve that government, but that those rulers are wise and caring, and when something goes wrong, they will do something about it, or they could be appealed to to do something about it. Now, that tradition, I think, still remains. It's still primary in the Chinese one. In a different tradition, like the like the, uh, the kind of tradition in city-states of Greece, obviously, is a different tradition of good governance, that you actually participate in debates in the marketplace and, and actually expect to have a role to play in, in making for a republican state or something like that, or a city-state. But there is no such tradition in China. The opposite is the just, caring ruler who is wise and always will do the right thing when the time comes. In the meantime, you are faced with avaricious officials, greedy, corrupt, all of them around you. You know that that is not true. This is the, the real world was, a, was very harsh and cruel. But at the back of your mind is this, the caring ruler somehow would, would get it all sorted out eventually. And that, I think, is the tradition I'm referring to. And that, I'm not sure, is universal. And it, it varies from place to place. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I also love that um, discussion of surnames, but I want to get straight to the issue of heritage and what we preserve in whatever nation, state or country we're in, and how we do this calculation that you spoke about. Um, the idea that um, China, and by that the state of China, is able to calculate what is important and what is kept I think would be contested by most of the minorities around the edges. 
uh, for example, in Turkestan or other places. So that idea of who calculates what is important to us does, I think, require participation, a community participation, because I'm not sure that in most of our countries, um, and probably very sure that the Chinese nation state is not adequately able to calculate what is important for all of, it, all of its people. You're, you're quite right. In fact, I try to distinguish between the different levels at which heritage is conceived. And uh, why I started with the, with the lowest level, the most common level, is how each individual or each group of people uses heritage for his own life or her life, uh, the way they organize in private, in, in private businesses, in the operations, and so on. And that relationship between them and somebody else is dependent on some past experience or some imaginative past, imagined past experience which enabled them to group together in a meaningful way. So that is one level, but there are many, many levels. And at the highest level, of course, as I mentioned before, the rulers and their elite groups, they determine what heritage would suit them and what heritage is essential for their rule or the continuance, the continuance of their rule and what would enable them to keep their powers intact and determine the shape and size of their the, the realms. And so many levels have different ways of dealing with heritage. And I also mentioned why there, there is a role for, for historians, where the, even in the Chinese traditional context, the historian, the Confucian Mandarins who are handling the history office, even they have a role because they can pick and choose to correct the emperor's decision of what should be heritage, to keep on the in, on the, in the records of things which the emperor did not approve of or did not necessarily agree with, to keep the records for that to ensure that the heritage is, is richer and not so narrowed down to serve a particular dynastic house, and that sort of thing. So there are many levels. Each level, of course, heritage is used differently. Selfishly in some cases, more universally acceptable in others, but different. So again, this only brings out, I'm afraid, something that you all know about, which is the complexities of it all. So I, what I wanted to emphasize is that at these different levels of heritage, each of them is heritage of one kind or the other. So what we mean by cultural heritage today, even as defined in, the, in, the, in UNESCO's sites and so on, that's only one kind of heritage, it seems to me. The other kinds of heritage, which operate at the personal level, at down below, and operate at the highest government level, who have very clear ideas of what they want to see preserved and what they don't want to see preserved. And that is very often done, as we all know. And that is why there is a question of not allowing your history to be hijacked and abused. Is that you have to know it yourself to be able to, to challenge it from time to time when you see it being hijacked and abused, so to speak, and, and at different levels when you see it happen. But to all, in order to do that, and this is my real point, I, which is a very local point in Singapore, and Brenda knows that, and that is the neglect of history in the study of history in, in, in Singapore. For decades, this has been a very serious neglect in my view. And actually, I think the younger generation in Singapore have been deprived of a chance to evaluate their history properly and learn how to do it. And to be asked to not to bother about it, it seemed to me, is a real threat to the future of Singapore. I, I know there are many hands, but I would like uh, Prof Wang to elaborate a little bit about on, on that particular point because I think it's such a very important one. He defined heritage as the expression of the relationship between the people and their past. And of course, you do need to know your past and the, the, the sort of glitzy parts of it, the gritty parts of it, in order for us to be able to have this relationship with the past. So, I mean, Prof Wang, could I ask you to say a bit more about what you see as uh, lacking uh, in the way that history is taught or not taught uh, in Singapore, uh, whether it's in the schools or the universities? Uh, universities are doing fine. They yeah, are okay, least, thank they're you, thank you. They're <laughs> teaching history. Right. History department has not been abolished yet. Not. All right, so, okay, so. But history has been so. abolished virtually mm -hmm. in schools. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that very difficult to understand. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can understand why it was, it was decided on in the early years of the city-state's uh, independence. Maybe I can understand that, but I find it regrettable that that was continued for so long. And the damage that it has done to a whole generation of people in Singapore, to me, is very hard to remedy. And I hope it will be remedied somehow. And I hope the universities can play a part in doing that. 
uh, to, 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 ca to catch up, as it were. Uh, but fortunately, I think in the last decade or two, there has been some revival of interest in history among young generations of Singaporeans and rediscovering, as it were, the importance of history. And I'm delighted to see that. How it should be taught, I don't think I could be, uh, one, one should be prescriptive about that. There are many ways of teaching history. The most important thing is to make people aware that there's a lot of it and you need a lot of effort to learn it and to learn it intelligently, to be critical of what the what this history means, where the sources are, where, why people tell you what they tell you, what happened in the past, and whether it's true or not. All these things are part and parcel of a very complex mix of learning processes, which I don't think can be laid down in, in, in a few sentences. It is a complex business, and it's not a problem for Singapore alone. It's a problem everywhere. In fact, the, there are uh, many, many countries in where, where history is not considered uh, useful or valuable, in fact, should be avoided. In many other countries where history ne needs to be manipulated and turned into useful ways of controlling uh, decisions and controlling policies. So there are so many ways. And I, I would say that Singapore must find its own way because it is a very distinctive society here, a plural society unique in itself. The, the mix of peoples, religions, cultures, and different traditions is so great and so different from anywhere else that I know that I would be the last person to say how history should be taught here. But not to teach it just because there's too, too varied and too mixed or too difficult and people are too different, I think that's a terrible mistake. And somehow you've got to find a way, and I expect Singaporeans to do it themselves, because only they can find out from their own lives, from the way they live, and from the way they see their own society developing, to find ways and means to remedy the kind of dangers that would come when people ignore their past or pretend that it didn't, doesn't exist. Right. Um, Helga? Thank you, Helga Novotny. I want to thank you for this great and very wise mm -hmm. talk. I was intrigued when you mentioned towards the end <clears throat> the appeal of, the, of progress and the way how it impacted uh, in building cities, etc. Now, the idea of progress is a, as a Western notion, has its own history. It started with the scientific revolution, the origin of modern science, and very soon a disappointment set in, because at that time people believed that science and the consensus that science created among scientists was able to be extended to society. And in other words, that scientific progress would bring moral progress. And this turned out to be an illusion. Then the idea of progress was reinforced by the Enlightenment. And now, if you describe modernity embodied in new buildings, roads, shopping malls, etc., this is but one, and people could say even a parody, of the idea of progress. But my question to you is really, was there something similar, different, to this idea of human betterment and how it could be brought about in what you were describing uh, about Chinese history? Thank you. I think you are absolutely right to draw attention to this very new idea, progress, is, progress, the idea of progress itself is such a new idea. In fact, I think all civilizations that I know of didn't ever think of it until very modern times. And to relate, relate it to science is absolutely a good thing to remind us of. It is tied up very much with scientific progress, positivist thinking, and so on. And even in Europe, if I remember correctly, in the 19th century, there were many, many voices raised to warn against the idea of progress, who drew upon the Renaissance to warn against the idea of progress, and to warn against the pretension that people had done that our brains are so fantastic that we will conquer the universe eventually, and so on. And to, to have, such, uh, uh, have such warnings, I think, itself shows that there are doubts, even, in, even where the idea of progress came from in Europe. Now, the Chinese, on the other hand, only came across this idea very recently. And the, the idea really exploded in their minds in the, at the beginning of the 20th century and took the, uh, took the place by storm. And a whole generation of new scientists and people who are 
uh, absolutely engrossed in the idea of a scientific uh, future for China uh, have taken over in China. For example, when the Chinese Communist Party won in 1949, they put all knowledge under the word science. Science is the one word for it. In fact, when they had the academy, they had the Academy of Sciences to include all knowledge. Social science was a part of it. And even to this day, uh, is, everything has got to have the word science in it. If it doesn't have the word science in it, somehow it's very inferior or definitely not, not, uh, not to be encouraged. And so as sort of new converts to the idea of science, they're more fanatical even than the Europeans. And of course, I, we are all caught up in that. I think most people in Asia uh, picked up the idea of progress very recently, and some are still absolutely immersed in the, it as an absolute faith in progress. There may be some doubters, uh, but I think they are still relatively few. And all our measurements of progress are still very dominantly still, and this is true of the West too. Everything that we use, everything that we use for purposes of all the tables we use, about rankings of one kind or the other, everything you can quantify, we, 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 we used to be to, to show how you have progressed. And we haven't really changed that much, even though there are doubters, that continues to determine how the world is rock, rocking along at a, at a fantastic rate, as it were. And, uh, and will continue to. And I'm constantly being reminded, I think there was the latest issue of one of the black journals I've been re reading, which is all about the fourth knowledge revolution which will totally transform the world beyond our imagination. Well, I, I'm, I'm delighted to hear about that, but I'm not sure that that is something that can sustain us in other parts of our lives. I mean, we're not all scientists, we're not all numerate, we're not all concerned with material progress. I don't think so anyway. I think there are others who have other demands. So I think this, it doesn't cope with the variety of people and the variety of experiences that people want for themselves. And not all of it is measurable by the idea of progress. And I. Without, I'm not going to overthrow the idea of progress, not that it is possible, I don't think it is, it is possible. I think uh, human beings are now so enamored of it, I think they will die with it and go on, even if it ends with total, total destruction, they will go on with it. So that's not possible, it won't, it won't end that. But I would like to see at least an, a part of the world being preserved and conserved to appreciate the heritage that does not have the idea of progress embedded in it. And uh, that, of course, requires you to have some sense of history, some sense of the past, some sense of respect for the past. Now, the Chinese idea of respect, which is drawn so much from the respect of ancestors as a kind of, uh, a, um, a kind of um, synonym for all kinds of respect, is, is, not, uh, is not going to go away. I think the Chinese will continue to have some of that. So maybe that will save the Chinese people from absolute and total infatuation with the idea of progress. I hope so, anyway. So, ancestors versus science. So, we'll see. I mean, I think that's, uh, there's a lot of uh, in there that needs it's further thought. They normally call it, it's not only social, they call it human sciences. Human Humanities sciences, becomes right, human right, sciences. Right, right, They've okay. got to add the word science in, otherwise it's, it's yes, not worth it. Right. Not worth anything. Right, okay. Um, I know there are many more hands, so can I see who, who else wants to ask a question? Because I have to sort of ration the last few minutes that we have. There's one there, one there. Any others? Right, okay, so then uh, perhaps the, the lady at the back, yeah? And one there, right, okay. Hi, hi Professor. Thank you so much for your very uh, uh, exciting uh, talk. I just want to um, continue along the strain that you mentioned um, that uh, we all have pasts and I was thinking about you know indigenous parts, pasts and indigenous knowledges or even vernacular you know knowledge that is um, encapsulated in vernacular um, records which are not physical documented tangible records and how would a country like Singapore deal with these vernacular records when you talk about teaching history? How does this bottom, bottom ground history, which is very oral, which is very um, tactile, go up into the system? That's my question. Well, um, there is so much variety, and you're quite right. 
And of course, my idea of history is not r limited to history textbooks or history that are found in records and documents, but including all the other sources and there are all the varieties of sources of, that you can, that can take you back of the past, including uh, artifacts of uh, anthropology and archeology, span artifacts in the language, artifacts in people's practices and so on. Many of which we, 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 we know the practices are sustained for centuries, maybe even longer, and not everybody knows where they come from or why they do what they do. I mean, I don't know how many of you were there last night to watch the Taipusam festivals. I, I saw part of it, and I was very touched by what uh, people believed in and what they, were, what they did, how they enjoyed and how they, how they uh, participated in it. I wish I knew more about the origins, but those people who know it may not have put it down or it may not be part of the, the heritage that Singapore government actually acknowledges and, and puts out anywhere. But I think the fact that they, it is now encouraged and it's allowed to be performed publicly to everybody, to everyone to, to learn and understand is a very good sign. I think that's something. You don't have to have it in a, in a textbook or, and so on. It can be demonstrated, shown on the, shown on the streets, performing public performances, and just practices, unselfconscious practices of what people genuinely, spiritually uh, are tied to. That could be tremendously meaningful and how it makes you relate to other people, how it relates you to some sense of the past, and very remote and ancient past. It doesn't matter how much time, but how, how deeply embedded it is in your culture and among your own people and people you know, and how it can help you uh, relate to people you don't know. All these things are part of, to me anyway, part of that heritage. But it does bring you back to some sense of history, and I'm using history in the broader sense, to get that past into your own lives, to make you at least conscious of how it is related to your present living. So that's, I think Prof Wong said so meaningfully just now, I mean, how the past can be actively present. I mean, there's something that we need to, again, give a lot more thought to. Uh, I think there are at least a couple of questions, so down at the front. Um, if you could pass the mic down. Prof, thank you very much, and Prof Brenda too, with due regard and respect. I thank you very much of your profound providence and, and real sin sincerity. I appreciate it very much indeed. So my question here, in terms of reference here, can you forego or, you know, compromise on the question of heritage over civilization? Now, the question here very much, you notice that what you say, that the matters have been hijacked, in, in the world of the era of, uh, you know, diverse and commoditization of uh, uh, competencies. Now, you notice too that, you know, that in, in, in the situation of compromisation of uh, academics, caution over business economic caution. Now, how do you ensure that we could overcome this genuinely because the future is more complex than yesterday's complexity. How do you ensure that you know that uh, the principle that we wish to attain will always be there? And the question is, the common sense will override the uncommon sense. Which one comes first? Thanks a lot. Chicken and the egg, sir. Well, that's a, that's a very big question. I, I, I'm not sure we can ensure anything. Uh, all, I, all I'm really suggesting is that uh, uh, if, you, if you neglect understanding the past, your own heritage, as it were, you are impoverished. You are less prepared to deal with the complexities of the future. Let us say that the past, if you don't know the past, the future must look even more uncertain, at least to, to my mind. And the future is uncertain enough already. It's pretty terrifying, frankly, for an old man like me. Uh, it, it wasn't so bad when I was young, but it's much more frightening today. But so it's highly complex. But if I'm aware that life has always been complex, the, diff the complexities were different, or a different quality of complexity, or of a, a different nature of complexity, but the complexities have always been there. It is part of our past. 
And in fact, all our lives, we are sorting them out in our own lives. What we choose to remember and what we choose to forget is part and parcel of that learning about complexity and why, what is relevant and what is not, what is useful and what is not. All these are very practical ways of responding to complexity. And the future will always be like that. I don't see any different. Just that we, I expect the younger people, we have a much more complex response, a modern complex response to complex modernities, whereas I in the past can't quite do that, can't cope with that. But I, but I feel that my knowledge of the past, my understanding of how the past, in the past people responded to different circumstances, and how people today use the past to, to solve some of their own problems or to, to, to sort out their own thinking and so on how this happens all the time, then I do genuinely believe that that will always be true. That even as you face your future, be prepared and you are better prepared if you know your past. And if you don't know it, the worse off you are. That's all I can, nothing can be unsured. Um, um, I think we do have to move on because time's a key run now, but I did uh, promise, I think the gentleman in, in the middle, uh, uh, a chance to ask his question. So that has to be the last question. Uh, of course, uh, there'll be time at tea. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very new here and I'm very happy to have witnessed this wonderful um, talk. Uh, mine is very short and it's perhaps not even a question. Uh, you mentioned the concept of useful past. And so useful reflection on the past, I could then conclude, useful history. Uh, wouldn't in this conference this concept call for the mediation or call for a reflection on the mediation of politics in this whole problem? I, would rever I could reverse it. If there is an unuseful past or an unuseful history, the dangers involved with it uh, can perhaps be debated on uh, on a more successful way if we consider the importance of politics in all of this? Well, I, I think I've probably been uh, provocative in using the word usable, um, but I was using it very much in the context of the very pragmatic Chinese response. And certainly the evidence of the Chinese way of looking at their past, how they sift, as it were, sort out what they need and what they don't need is based primarily on usable usefulness. And usefulness, something that they can use. Uh, but, it, but usefulness, of course, itself is a very elusive idea because something that is useless today may be very useful tomorrow. So what you need to have in a way is you need a store, you need that treasure. You need a store if it were in your memory or in your consciousness. And knowledge of the past is one kind of store, kind of reservoir of other people's experiences as well as your own. But if you have that, if your store is richer and full of all kinds of interesting examples and so on, you never know what is useful there and what is not. So it's not that one can determine this is useful and that is not. I think there's no such thing. But what is usable is when you need it and you, can, you know about it and you know that it is relevant to what you need, then it becomes useful. But if you didn't even know about it, you have lost a whole store of treasure of things which could have helped you and could have enriched you as it could have made you more uh, uh, ready to, to, meet, uh, to meet a particular challenge. You don't even know about it, so that's your loss. So in that sense, I think I was bring, bring, using the, the t idea of being useful or not. But I do recognize that that is not the only criteria. But I think for the Chinese, that is the most obvious criteria that I can see. Every, every, all the evidence that I have learned about the nature of, Ch not only the Chinese people of Singapore, the nature of Chinese civilization has been built very much with that tradition in mind, usefulness. And it's a, it's in fact, almost all Chinese knowledge has to do with usefulness. That is one of the reasons why in the very profound questions asked about why the Chinese not develop science, and they had technology but no science. One of the possible answers is that the Chinese are always interested in what is useful. And if, they, if the kind of scientific thinking that is not usable, not useful, useful to them, it would not occur to them, they would not have encouraged, they would not have encouraged someone to spend their lives in some laboratory somewhere doing tests of something which nobody knows 
what's going to be useful for? And that somehow would not be, have a high appeal to all the Chinese records that I've seen, how the people on, on the contrary would emphasize the need, we need to solve this problem. And problem solving, that, that's not a new word. I mean, I know people think it's a, a word of the Industrial Revolution, but I think problem solving is one the Chinese think at the, at the way back in the Chinese uh, practical way of looking at the world is they see a problem, find a way to solve it. And once it's solved, they don't go further to pursue the principles underlying the solution that they found. So they found solutions to many, there are many technological inventions the Chinese had that even Francis Bacon acknowledges them. But the Chinese did not pursue the underlying principles, the scientific principles underlying it, because that may not be of any use. Whereas what was discovered, the methods they discovered, the found to, to work, that is useful. Then you pursue that, you encourage that, you reward the guy for having done that. But to go and work out some mathematical problem which nobody knows and understands and will not understand for another few centuries is something that uh, would not appeal to most Chinese. Right. On that note, I mean, I think we ought to thank uh, Prof Wang for giving us a fresh sense of what it means, what living history really means and how it is that uh, it is only by connecting with our past, with our histories, that we connect with ourselves. So thank you very much, Prof Wang, and uh, if we could uh, show our appreciation in the usual way.